adoption a combined AMS and geochronological study to provide new temporal constraints on late Caledonian transcurrent tectonism. So when you're ready there, Will. Okay. Uh, can you guys hear me? And can you see a screen that has a poster on it? Yeah? Cool. Yep. Um, just before I kick off, uh, just to follow on from Ali's chat there, I, I hope you can all see the utility in what he's attempting to do here. But uh, unfortunately, my piggy bank has not yet stretched to purchasing a, a, a proper working VSM or VTFB. So I may knock or Ali may knock on your doors for assistance with that. Obviously, that sort of machinery is what's required to generate the volume of data that he needs. Um, okay, so uh, this is the wee picture that I took on my way in this morning. We got lots of nice snow um, uh, in St. Andrews there overnight. Um, yeah, this this talk is is uh, zooming out a little bit, um, and and what we're attempting to do is add a little bit of clarity to the timing of uh, transitions between tectonic stress fields during our genesis. Um, just as a bit of context, this is a very simple uh, diagram of, of what we kind of envisage um, the Iapetus Ocean to have looked at in or around, let's say, 600 million years, 500 million years ago. Um, we have the Acadian Laurentian Vulcan supercontinents in kind of three separate corners of the Iapetus prior to the Iapetus Ocean closing. Um, and we, we know that the closing of, of that ocean involved multiple orogenic events, such as the, the Grampian event where we have an island arc colliding um, onto the margin of Laurentia, the Penascotian, um, Turnesque closing of the Turnesque Sea, uh, it, it, in the version of, 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 of Miles and Woodcock, the, the Acadian is the closure of this reef ocean down here. But uh, if, if you go by the original definition of the Acadian, actually, that's to do with closure of the Iapetus Ocean. Um, so we know that this closure event occurred, and we know that this closure event brought the, 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 this, this northern part of Scotland into contact with the, with the rest of the, of the UK. And, and we also understand that this closure uh, culminated in a period of transcurrent tectonics, uh, initially transpression and later on transtension. Um, the evidence for these transpressive and transtensive events, and, and indeed the closure of the Iapetus, is evidence that most of us, I think, are familiar with. That there's a, a wealth of, of paleontological evidence to show the continents uh, coming together and closing. There, there's a reasonable amount of paleomagnetic data. Um, uh, there, there's a there's a a huge amount of evidence from sedimentary basins that tell us uh, when regimes were, were in, in convergent phases versus transtensive phases. And of course, uh, there's structural evidence from things like accretionary prisms or fold and truss belts. Um, the issue with all of this um, is that even with these uh, multiple sources of, of data that are summarized here in a diagram from Soper and Woodcock, um, is, is that the, there remains a discrepancy of somewhere anywhere from 10 to 15, maybe even 20 million years in when this final phase of closing and, and transpression translated into a, a, a period of transtension. Um, to try and close this gap, a, a range of approaches uh, have been taken. One, one very nice piece of work done here by Miles in 2016 uh, compiles quite a large volume of uh, geochronological data and, and what you can see um, of course these geochronological data points are, are taken from um, the, the, a host of, of late Caledonian intrusions that occur across uh, Britain and Ireland and, and, and what we see of course are, are, are spikes and troughs and spikes and troughs in the uh, rate and volume of, of magma that's being produced at different times. And, and these uh, spikes and troughs are correlated in a way with the perceived tectonic events. So we have Iapetus subduction occurring over here from in around 440 to in around something like you know, 225. We have uh, late transpression in this model extending to 420. We have transtension in this model onsetting at 420 extending down to something like 405. And then we have this 
Cadian event, which in, in this model is closure of the Rheic Ocean, not the Iapetus, uh, occurring sometime between 405 into something like 3, 395. Um, and one of the nice things about these data is that it gives you absolute timestamps to say, right, at this time, a certain volume of magma of a certain chemistry was produced. Um, and, and that's useful. And, and in many instances, the isotopic and geochemical data arising linked to those timestamps is tied to tectonic processes, igneous petrogenic processes. And those petrogenic processes are hung off the perceived tectonic stress conditions. But the problem, of course, is that the geochronology in itself doesn't actually tell you what the stress condition was, and nor does really the isotopic data. Um, the, 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 the tectonic framework is, is basically interpreted off this, um, but it's not a real direct reflection of it. Um, and, and this results in ambiguity. Um, two very good examples of this, two papers published one after another in the same year by four people who are really leaders in the geo uh, Caledonian geological world. So from Woodcock versus Dewey and Strachan, um, and they both conclude differences of about 10 to 15 million years between when this tectonic framework changed from net compression or transpression to net transtension. Um, and the, the problem really seems to be that there's a lack of um, there's a lack of strain markers that can be temporally constrained. So it would be wonderful if we could take things like little reduction spots or imagine that the crust was full of sponges and we could see when the sponges were being compressed or when the sponges were being extended. Um, so with this in mind, um, I thought that perhaps we could use AMS to do this. Um, there's nothing really new about suggesting that AMS can record tectonic strain. Uh, people have been doing this for, for many years. One study that comes to mind is the Ross of Mull in, in Scotland, where Petronas et al. argued that the AMS fabric was partly an emplacement fabric, but partly a tectonic overprint, um, and, and built a model around that. Um, but, but what we decided to do was to select a suite of intrusions, uh, and our suite of intrusions is in, in, in Connemara on the west coast of Ireland. And these intrusions, of course, are located right in the middle of all this uh, late Caledonian tectonics. Um, this suite of intrusions uh, should have a fairly tight constraint with regard to their age, so good, good age determinations. Uh, we need to collect AMS data from each of those intrusions, which intruded at different times. And we want to compare the evidence that we see in those intrusions to determine if we can pick up differences in the strain history at different times during late stage orogenesis. Um, and after we've done all that, we can rejoice and say, way we found temporally constrained strain markers in orogenic settings, or we can be bitterly disappointed when we discover that the AMS is just recording magma flow and not strain at all. So let's see what happened. So uh, this is a map of, of Connemara. Um, uh, I know a limited number of you will be familiar with this, or sorry, and many of you will be unfamiliar with this. Um, it's located in, in, the, in the middle part of Ireland on the west coast. Uh, it's one of the largest Caledonian complexes in Britain and Ireland, as it turns out, by square uh, kilometers. Um, it's composed of a, a central uh, large uh, batholith called Kilkiran batholith. Um, and then several smaller intrusions. One is called Carna Pluton out here to the west of the main batholith. There's the round stone intrusion here and the uh, Omi intrusion up to the northwest. Um, now, we went ahead and did some geochronology on this and put it together with existing geochronology from people like Martin Feely and Quentin Crowley. Um, and you can show quite nicely, basically, that these intrusions, smaller intrusions to the northwest, are significantly older. Um, in and around 422, 423. That's quite nice because by Dewey or by Strachan's model or Sofer's model, um, this should be during transpression or should have intruded sometime during transpression. Uh, the Carna Pluton in and around 14 to 409 MA, um, nice. That should be by one model uh, post transpression, but by the alternative model, it should be uh, during trans tension. And um, then uh, the main batholith, which is in or around 400 and 
3-ish MA all the way down to successively younger intrusions, which cross cut the Kilkeran batholith down here. And these younger intrusions are as young as 380 million years. So that's definitely the latest that transpression could have been around 400 MA and, and 380 extends well into post Caledonian tectonics. So this suite of intrusions is quite nicely placed spatially in that it's right in the middle of the tectonic framework for the late Caledonian and temporally because it captures um, timings in early, well, during transpression right through that transtensive process. So we're going to show you some data uh, from Roundstone, from Omi, from Karna, and from the main batholith. And I'm going to blast through it because I certainly don't want to run over time. Um, the first part in our investigation, of course, is to do a nice, um, fairly robust uh, rock magnetic characterization. So building on from what Tobias was talking about earlier on, of course, AMS isn't as simple as just taking a measurement and presuming that the measurement reflects what you think it should reflect. And we collected over 500 sample sites uh, across these intrusions, an average of 12 subspecimens per site, so statistically quite robust. And we've characterized the magnetic mineralogy of more than 80 of these samples. We have used temperature versus susceptibility. We've used IRM acquisition and BIRM fields. We used Larry Fuller test. We used three component demagnetization test, all with a view of constraining exactly what the magnetic carriers are in here. And so that we can distinguish, let's say, um, normal fabrics from inverse fabrics or hydrothermal fabrics. And we could strip away fabrics that we feel are associated with post emplacement solid state processes or hydrothermal alteration. So this gives us the best chance of capturing, let's say, the, the tectonic or, or, or strain of, uh, that, that occurred as a consequence of tectonic strain. So this is a, an example of some of our um, uh, temperature versus susceptibility results. Um, as you can see, uh, fairly boring stuff. Um, uh, temperature uh, on the increase here uh, in red uh, and on the cooling in, in blue, and you can see that effectively all of these results just go all the way up to almost 580 degrees Celsius and then drop straight down to uh, paramagnetic behavior past the Curie temperature. So this is, you know, very, very straightforward, uh, near stoichiometric, very, very low titanium uh, magnetite. Uh, we went on and took many of those samples uh, and did some IRM and BIRM tests. And again, you can see you know, the samples reaching saturations in very, very low uh, IRM fields, again, inferring that there's magnetically very, very soft magnetite. And we went ahead and did three component tests on these again, just to check and see if, let's say, there were um, anomalous proportions of things like hematite in there or features that could be a consequence of things like weathering and things like that. Um, and in the vast majority of samples, as expected, of course, um, it is you know multi-domain or, or fine-grained multi-domain magnetite um, expected to give you you know normal AMS fabrics. Um, in some of the samples, however, uh, we did find a uh, quite large proportion of sulfides. For example, in this one, G15, we got a nice big peak here at about 300 degrees on the heating curve, pointing strongly towards the presence of some sulfide minerals. Got another lump here occurring at about 520. To me, this looks like magnetite that's actually growing as the sample's being heated. Um, and then, of course, the cooling curve is completely irreversible. And this is telling us that the magnetic mineralogy of this sample is quite different from what is characteristic in, around the other intrusions. Um, when we do our BIRM, IRM fields, we can see that the coercivity of these minerals are, are much higher as well. Um, and in some cases, need fields of greater than you know one to 1.2 Teslas or, or more to, to fully saturate, pointing towards the presence of very high coercivity minerals that's atypical of the rest of the intrusion. Um, as it turns out, many of these samples uh, have been uh, collected near a, a known porphyry that occurs in the center of the Omi pluton, in the center of the Karna pluton, and on the side of the Karna pluton. Um, and in some instances, this is very obvious, and you can see it in a field like this where you get very nice filler alteration, uh, mineral, uh, molybdenite mineralization, chalcopyrite, things like that. Um, but in, in some samples, you don't necessarily see this very obviously in the field, but you do see it in the AMS or in the uh, rock magnetic data. Um, and we were able to strip these samples away 
um, allowing us to, again, focus on fabrics that are more closely related or more definitively related to uh, tectonic strain during the in it, it, original crystallization of, of the magma. So jumping into some data, um, this is some data from the Ramstone Pluton, again, about 423 um, MA. Um, the geological context for this is, is fairly tightly constrained. People have mapped this for the last 40, 50 years. Uh, quite simple, really. You have some metagabro in the country rock. You have Dalradian supergroup sediments uh, in the country rock, which are intruded by that metagabro. And all of this is understood to be in the hanging wall to a regional thrust, which the foot wall is exposed through this tectonic window over here. So in cross section, the, the geological setting looks a, a little bit like this. You have the Delaney Dome, it's, it's a rhyolite in the, in, the, in the foot wall. In the hanging wall, you have um, the metamorphic complex in Connemara, which is metagabro and, and Dalradian supergroups. And into that, we have the, the, the round stone granite uh, intruded. Um, now, AMS data, on the left here, we have a contour plot of shape and isostropy, um, TJ, uh, just, just contoured. Uh, one of the very striking things that you see here is that the, all of the um, linear uh, or prolate fabrics tend to occur along the near the center of this intrusion and, and certainly along the sort of northwest, southeast um, sort of axis. Um, and one of the other very interesting things we see is when we uh, kind of make detailed field maps in here, detailed field observations, is that where we see injections of different granitoid facies, that the contacts between these facies are low bait or they are diffuse, inferring that um, these are certainly magma-magma uh, interactions. There, there's no evidence for any solid state deformation in here. So we can conclude that the fabrics being recorded are um, magmatic state fabrics. Time there, Will. How much? Uh, you've, uh, you've gone over, so. What? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so I'll cut to the chase. When we model that AMS data up onto a Sterionet, we see that the K3 axes um, to these AMS data are, are sub-horizontal and orientated in the northeast and the southwest of a Sterionet. If I jump ahead, because I'm out of time now, to the OMI Pluton, again, we get a very similar structural signature in our AMS data, again, with a sub-horizontal um, or gently inclined K3 axis along a northwest, um, southeast sort of, uh, or sorry, north, south, west, northeast axis. Um, again, in, in the Karna Pluton, we have a very, very similar structural signature. And at this point, we're quite young. We're down to about 410 million uh, years. And again, we have very compelling evidence to show that these fabrics have been imparted during the magmatic state. Samples taken from this locality with this biotite modal layering, which is very clearly a magmatic state fabric, still returns these steeply inclined magmatic foliations. Um, the last sample site then is across the main battlet, across the Kilkiran battlet, along this um, blue box, this, this blue uh, traverse here. Um, and long story short, what we see is a pure shear flattening fabric uh, to the north. And as you traverse down to the center of this intrusion, the fabrics change to become prolate and critically the K3 axis rotates to become vertical, which is telling us that the sigma one has now flipped and is now in a vertical position. So putting this together, what we see is that about 420 and right down to 410 million years, we have a sigma three that is sub-horizontal inferring that magma is in a compressive uh, field. But by the time we get to about 402, sigma 3 is vertical, telling us that sigma 1 is now vertical. And that is consistent with a trans, uh, well, with an extensional environment, i.e. trans uh, tension. So the final model that we've come up with is where we have the tectonic framework of Connemara, the Skirdrock's fault to the south, Highland Boundary fault to the north. 
uh, during regional sinistral transpression, sigma one, of course, is on the horizontal uh, plane, um, promoting anti-clockwise block rotation as the only pluton and roundstone pluton intrude. Um, by the time we get to 410, the current of pluton is intruding still within this net compressive stress field, um, imparting steep, uh, a, a kind of a steeper structural fabric uh, within that intrusion. And by the time we get to uh, 400 MA, the stress field has evolved to be uh, transtensive, allowing larger volumes of magma to intrude, and the structural fabric recorded in magmas that cool at that time um, are provide basically sub-horizontal magnetic fabric and a uh, sub-horizontal magnetic uh, lineation. So uh, that's just the summary there. Based off these data, it, it would indicate the transtension in this part of the origin belt uh, didn't really onset until after 410. Um, and we feel that this provide this is the potential to provide a nice new tool that allows us to provide temporal alley constrained strain markers in origin in general. It's worth noting that we've tried this in Donegal and had a go at it in Mull and Etiv, and we're getting similar results at similar times. So it suggests that this works not just in Connemara, but across origin in general. Thank you. Um, thanks for that, Will. Um, Adrian, you said your talk's not that long, so if you're willing, then we can have one very quick question, if that's okay with you, Adrian. Yes. So, so yep. Yep, go for it. So, so which of the two models was correct? Can I tell Nigel Woodcock he's right or wrong? I, I, I... I'd prefer to tell him myself uh, for fear that you just drop me in a, and I'll make an enemy forever. <laughs> but in 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 my based off the data that I can see there, I can see trans tension onsetting after 410 because I have an intrusion that is 410 million years old, and there are steep fabrics in it, um, and that's consistent with all the intrusions that we have data from that we know intruded during transpression. So. Uh, that's presuming that you accept that the AMS fabric is in fact yeah. from that and not another process, but I have evidence for that, which I think works. Okay. Uh, yeah, Conal's hand is up there, so we'll just one quick question. Yeah. We'll so, so, so your transition from transpression to transtension, you've modeled with anti-clockwise rotation in, in the area of the main granite. Every published study of rocks ranging in age from Ordovician right the way through to Silurian in that area are all clockwise. Uh, there's a study by Robertson on the Connemara Gabbro, which is in the south western corner. Uh, there's two papers by Mark Smethurst on Silurian rocks that actually range right the way along the northern part of that area, and, and every single published rotation is clockwise. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, I think you find Dewey, Jakes, and Reedy as well also ha have a have the opposite block rotation model. Um, and well, the truth be told, if that block is rotating one way or the other, doesn't necessarily change the broader model. I just have to have a rotation going one way or the other. But if if you if you take a wee ice cube and put a sinistral strike slip across top of it, well, that's the direction it goes in. So. Well, it depends which side you pin it on. <laughs> well, it does, yes, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. So, so I, have a, I have a very, and it's sort of a, a quick follow up question, but have you measured the um, remnants on any of these samples? Um, I have, yes. Uh, I and don't have off the top of my head, but yes, we did all that as, a, as part of the, the first step of the rock, char rock mag characterization, yeah. Yeah, but, but you haven't done, you haven't demagged any of them. Uh, we did, yeah. Well, we demagged it, AF demag. Uh, okay. Yeah. Did those directions show anything? Uh, I, not offhand. Uh, but w what are you alluding towards? Those I can check. Well, well, the, well, well, well. You know, very simple test would be if you've got any coherent remnants in there, any coherent remnants directions, you could see are they rotated or not. For your block rotation. Yeah. yeah so, so actually, for at the only intrusion, I. I attempted to do that because there's a 
well, I hypothesize you got two shear zones bounding a block of granite in the middle, which we have data and remnants data from. But in my opinion, I didn't really see, I didn't think the data looked particularly good and weren't particularly reliable. Uh, Mike Petronas agreed, and I just thought, okay, fair enough, and I left it at that. Um, but I suppose it's not the, you wouldn't necessarily expect the, the granite plutons themselves to be rotating, you're expecting the blocks adjacent to them to rotate. So I suppose if you wanted to test that, you want to have a look at the dikes that are cross-cutting maybe the earlier dikes or perhaps even the um, some of the earlier Grampian intrusions because they would have been obviously pre the onset of transgression and yeah but the, the Grampian ones are clockwise rotated this is the this is the problem yeah um okay yeah yeah maybe we should chat maybe we should chat about this but this some more I, I collected a whole lot of samples from their donkeys years ago and we measured fabrics we went for all the mafic enclaves oh cool yeah um and i'm trying to remember there was there was some coherence in the in the fabric data but the remnants data was just shite yeah mike had me treat because i i mean i did the mag experiments as a phd student uh yeah. so mike was just basically telling me what to do and i did what i was told for the most part sometimes um but yeah, we, we treated them with, you know, low temperature cryogenic before we demag them and stuff. And I mean, it's like it's such coarse grained multi-domain stuff that yeah, it was a bit iffy. And so I didn't dig into it too much. But yeah, we, I, it'd be useful to chat with you afterwards about yeah. it. Yeah. Let's, do, let's do that. I'll, I'll, I'll dread stuff from the bottom drawer somewhere. <laughs> yeah.